Welcome. I'm Leslie Cannon. I'm Mary Gavoni. I'm Linda Harvey. I'm Olivia Wan, and together we are the Compliance Divas. Welcome to the Compliance Divas podcast. I'm Mary Gavoni, and I will be your moderator for this episode. We bring clarity and com- simplicity to compliance by navigating the regulatory environment to keep you on course. You can subscribe to the Compliance Divas podcast through your favorite podcast channel or on our website, thecompliancedivas.com. All the resources we mention during our podcast today can be found on thecompliancedivas.com, and you can submit questions to support at thecompliancedivas.com. Most dental practices have been experiencing staffing and other HR issues throughout the pandemic. To discuss these and future concerns, we have invited Adrian Twig, co-owner of Bent Erickson and Associates, an HR firm specializing in HR for dentistry, to address some of these issues with us today. So welcome, Adrian. We are so thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here with you and to discuss all these crazy wild things that are going on. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Adrian. So Leslie and Olivia are not able to be with us today, but they have both um, asked or posed some questions for you. And so the first one we have for you, Adrian, um, is from Leslie. And she says that so many dental practices are experiencing staffing issues and have hired people without dental experience for either their front desk or chair side openings. And eventually the seasoned team, dental team members may want to come back or need to come back to work. So is it likely experienced employees are a better fit? Of course, we know that. But if there's not room for them, new or returning team members, how does the dentist handle the termination of the less experienced person and rehiring the more experienced person? Wow. Well, that is really a great question. Um, and I'll have to tell you that we could spend all day just unpacking that question. Um, But let's just start kind of at at the beginning. Um, If you have team members that you have hired during this pandemic that don't really have dental experience, but you've hired them and they fit, they fit culturally, they fit with the team, their attitude is one that they can get in there and they can learn, you're ahead of the game. And that is one thing that we always advise, whether you're hiring during a pandemic or just in normal circumstances, whatever normal is nowadays, that we advise that you are hiring for attitude, for fit, for values. These are the basic things that you can't train for. So let's say that you have hired new team members and they fit all of those criteria and those examples that I just gave. So maybe they're doing okay, you know, and and sometimes we have found that when you hire someone, they may not have dental experience, but you can train them if they have the right attitude they may work out better than someone that comes to you with 10 years of experience say at the administrative position in the front and you're having to untrain things and retrain towards the way that you want them to do things. Sometimes that new employee without all of the quote unquote training works better, works more efficiently in your practice because they have the attitude that you need and they bring the values and they can catch on to the vision of the practice. So. Um, it's not just a simple, oh, we're going to let this person go because they don't have experience and this person with 10 years, we're going to bring them in. So you really have to approach it from that aspect, first of all. But then legally, you also have to look at things like protected classes. And if you're bringing someone back and you're going to let that newly hired person go, 
you have to make sure that you're not stepping across any lines legally, such as age discrimination, or if perhaps that newly acquired employee or team, team member has told you that they're pregnant, or if there's any other of those discrimination things that you need to be aware of. So um, some people will say, well, I live in an at-will state, so I can terminate anyone anytime I want to and not get into trouble. Well, the not get into trouble aspect is what you have to be aware of because if you are um, letting go a person who is over 40 years of age, which is the legal age right now in this country for age discrimination, and you're bringing back a 25 year old or a 30 year old, you need to be aware that that 40 year old that you are terminating is in a protected class. So you, there are other things that you just have to be mindful of. Now, if that newly hired team member really isn't doing the job and you have things that you can really point to and say, well, he or she isn't measuring up here, here, and here. And I have this either returning team member that you know, you have experience with, that knows how the practice runs and is able to fulfill those job requirements better. Okay, then you know you might be you might be okay. But it's not just a matter of letting that newly acquired team member go because you're bringing someone back or bringing someone in with more experience. So it really depends on a case by case situation. And I can't urge you too much. Uh, just be careful. Be careful that you know those protected classes and that you're taking those things into consideration if and when you start to terminate that newer hired person. Does that make sense? It does, Adrian. Thank you so much. It's not just very straightforward. It, it really does depend. And that could also be, I think, in, um, demoralizing to the rest of the team to know that, you know, if somebody wants to come back, they could easily be replaced. So thank you very much for that, um, that explanation. Linda, you had some questions about recruiting. So let's turn this over to you. Thank you, Mary. And, and Adrian, likewise, all the divas were, were so happy that you could join us on such an important topic because, you know, I've recognized and we all have for years, HR is a, a critical role in a dental practice as is, is in any business. And it's more, more critical now than ever in smaller businesses like dental, solo dental practices. Sure. I'd like to take a chance and kind of go further with, with the question that you just had with, with Leslie, because I've noticed this trend and not just this year, but even last year, maybe before that dental practices are beginning to recruit team members outside of dentistry. They have no dental experience and maybe no healthcare experience. Sometimes they're working in the business office and sometimes they're working in a clinical role, such as a dental assistant or maybe a sterilization tech. And I really liked how you talked about, you know, somebody being a good fit culturally and attitude wise and their values. And I also know that Ben Derrickson Associate talks about having that skills assessment when hiring somebody in the clinical role. So that may not fit, Adrian, for someone that has no experience. Do you have any tips for listeners when that happens? How can they evaluate somebody in a clinical role? Sure. Yeah, we do um, talk about the skills assessment and a lot of people will call it a working interview. So you can really open up Pandora's box when you get into the working interview situations. Um, you know, uh, before the pandemic and before the, the craziness ensued, it was possible you could bring people in and maybe ask them to work for a couple of hours, um, but pay them for what they were doing. And so that means that they are an employee, you are paying them. So you take on some risk with that. And we've talked a lot about that in seminars that we have provided that when you bring someone in for the quote unquote working interview, you're paying them, 
If they get a needle stick, that's on you to send them in for the uh, medical tests and examinations that you, you guys are way more familiar with than me. Um, it could go on your workers' comp. It could, you know, it opens up the door to a lot of different things. So we suggest that you do the, the skills assessment. You have them come in, like I said, for a very short period of time, maybe an hour or two hours. They are not doing any productive work which means if you're bringing in a hygienist, she or he is not actually working on a patient. Um, so they're not replacing anyone. If you have a hygienist, let's say, that's out for the day and you think, oh, this is a great time to bring, you know, Susan in and, and try out her skills. Um, that's not what we're talking about doing. Um, we've had a lot of, of doctors that have said, well, if I want to test out a hygienist skills, what can I do? And we've said, well, doctor, you could have him or her work on your teeth, give you a cleaning, which mm -hmm. means yeah. if you're interviewing a lot of different people, you're going to have really clean teeth. However, you do get that firsthand knowledge about them, but you just have to be careful. There's a lot of criteria that the government has put in that if you're going to have someone come in, to do that skills assessment. Um, you know, like I said, you can't have them do productive work. They can't replace someone. They can't volunteer. So you have to be really clear up front. We recommend that you have documentation that they agree that they know they're not being paid, that they are not doing productive work and there's no promises of a job in the end. Um, have them shadow someone, maybe have them set up a tray for a specific procedure. If it's for a dental assistant, have them set up a tray for a crown prep, have them set up a tray for a filling, something like that, where it's, they're not actually hands-on with the patient. Uh, like I mentioned, the dental assistant could maybe clean the doctor's teeth. Um, a admin person could answer a fake phone call, could schedule a fake patient, something like that. Um, also, you can get into, if you, have, if you narrow it down and you think maybe you have a couple of, of candidates that after talking with them, uh, you think maybe each of them might be a pretty good candidate. We have what we call a Drake P3 personality assessment that we use. And it goes into things deeper than just, hi, how are you? What's your experience? That type of thing. The Drake P3 measures things such as social agility. It measures emotional intelligence. It measures motivators, demotivators, communication styles. And we have a database that has a list of candidates in there that are considered high achievers in each, each category, such as dental assistants, hygienist, uh, administrative staff, that you can compare. And it really gives you a good idea of some of the intrinsic values and characteristics of these people. So we are big proponents of that because it helps you look past just the regular answers of, oh, well, what do you think your strengths are? Or, oh, what are your weaknesses? Because after all, who can't really ace an interview? You know, I mean, you know what the interviewer wants to hear. Mm -hmm. So, but this assessment really does a deeper dive into some of the, the characteristics. So, um, you know, nowadays, we are advising people, you do um, a phone interview, first thing with these people that you are, are interviewing for this position. You, if, especially if it's for an administrative role, you wanna hear what they sound like over the phone. So what their phone voice is like, um, how they respond to your questions. So you do just a short interview, you know, maybe three minutes. And then if, if you feel like you wanna go further with that person, have them come in, pick up an application, 
Um, you don't have to spend a lot of time with them, but you get a sense of, of how they present themselves. They pick up the application and then they return it to you. And then maybe you do a, a video interview with that person so that you're able to see them. You know, if you're interviewing for a dental office or an orthodontic office, you kind of want to see what their smile is like because that's, you know, you're, that's the product that you're representing. So, but we want to get down to the human aspects of the person that you're, you're bringing on board. So um, certainly the interview, the video interview can help you. The telephone interview, like I said, you get a feel for how they respond to things over the phone. And then lastly, bringing them on to do an in-person interview, you know, mask or no mask behind plexiglass, whatever the mandate is for wherever you're located, you certainly follow that. But there are still steps that you can follow to get that person in and to have that one-on-one -on -one contact with them because because you, you need to know, does this person follow the philosophy that you're wanting to provide in your office? Do they agree with the values that you're setting forth? So you, you really wanna get a feel for them as much as you can um, in, in person as well. Adrian, that makes perfect sense. And I'm sitting here just thinking ahead that when an office does all those things, and this new team member is not measuring up, we've been focusing on folks that don't have dental experience and how to manage them. But even if they have dental experience, being an HR expert, could you just make a couple quick comments about how would someone go about you know, terminating anybody in their practice if they're not measuring up? Um, you've talked about the attitudes and values, and I know you've also talked about behavioral things in the past. So we just can't hire or fire somebody based on they don't have a pretty smile or we don't like their attitude. So maybe you could give our listeners a few tips on that, Adrian. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in the world of real estate, everything, the mantra is location, location, location. In the world of HR, our mantra is documentation, documentation, documentation. And with HIPAA and OSHA, uh, you know, it fits right into that, that uh, philosophy as well. So the first thing you want to make sure of is if you've got a team member that is not measuring up, that you are giving them feedback and that you're giving them feedback immediately. You're not waiting 30 days or 60 days, whatever, that when something happens that you are addressing that in a timely fashion, um, whether it's good or not so good. You know, when they do something really well, tell them and tell them right then and tell them in front of people. If they're doing something that is not measuring up, tell them, tell them as soon as possible. And by all means, do not tell them in front of other people. Your documentation comes into play as well. When you have these conversations with your team members, make notes on it. Let, you know, make notes of when it happened, what it was, um, whatever the conversation was with that team member so that you can refer back to that. And if it progresses, you want your notes to be more substantive. Um, if it comes down to, you know, you feel like this isn't improving, you need to sit down with that team member and say, okay, Marsha, we talked about you being tardy before and um, this is unacceptable. I need you to be here at 745 every morning and I need this to be start immediately. And if you're not here at 745 the next time, I may have to let you go. I may have to terminate you because we need you here to support our patient and patient flow. So you, the documentation needs to consist of what the job deficiency is, what the expected improvement is that you need to see by when you need to see it. And if you don't, what the consequences may be for that, whether it's something like you send them home 
for a day without pay or all the way to I'm going to have to let you go. So the documentation is a huge component of that whole process. Um, I mentioned at will earlier. At will has really been relegated down the totem pole, if you will, or down the list of things that you can use as far as just letting someone go on the spur of the moment. It used to be that you could let somebody go whenever without cause, just because. And now, because of all those protected classes and things that we talked about earlier, it's more difficult to do that without problems coming your way. So the main thing that we will emphasize if you are planning to terminate someone or thinking that you need to terminate someone, number one, hopefully you have a good HR source that you can call and get some guidance on um, as far as our clients, they call us and speak to one of our HR specialists. That HR specialist is going to run through a list of questions such as, do you have documentation? Uh, have you spoken with the employee about that? Um, just the back and forth to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row um, as far as that process goes before you say, okay, I'm at the end of the line with this person. I need to let he or she go. So there is a process and the documentation and the feedback and the conversations go a long way for that. So that's, that's really the line that we go down if someone is going to terminate an employee. Thanks, Adrian. That is fabulous information. And I think that because the pandemic has brought the emotional level up in, in the office, there's a lot of sensitivity about safety and, and do employers really care about their employees and so forth, that it magnifies those kinds of issues and keeps that, um, oh, the, the tension, I guess, at the, at the forefront. So a question we have from Olivia has to do with the need for written personnel policies. It seems like with all the confusion that we've had over, you know, can we ask an employee if they're vaccinated? Can we mandate that they're vaccinated and all those things probably increases the need for practices to have written policies as, a as opposed to kind of making them up as they go or um, saying, well, you know, this, this has been our policy, but it's nowhere in writing and no one um, really understands that. So can you briefly address how important it is to have those written policies and to be able to apply them equally to all employees? Yeah, it, it is absolutely critical that you do have a policy manual in place and not just any policy manual that you've kind of thrown together, but one that is compliant, compliant with your state mandates and laws, regulations, with your federal, um, any localities that are involved according to the number of employees that you have. And the bottom line with our experience and things that we have learned with our clients is when you have a policy manual in place and everyone knows that the policy manual is there, they have read it, they've signed their acknowledgement forms that say, yes, I, I have read the manual, I understand the policies. That makes a more secure workplace for your employees because they know there's a policy to handle things. There is a way that things will be handled consistently across the board and it is a fair and a level playing field and it really does bring a level of security to everyone in the practice when they know okay the the dentist the employer has thought these things out and they know how things are going to be handled they're not shooting from the hip and they're handling it one way on monday and a different way on thursday everybody is treated fairly Everybody is treated the same across the board that, like I said, it really does bring a level of security to the practice and to the employer as well, because you know that you have your policies in place and that you are current with things that are going on and that you are compliant. So if you're ever called into question, 
you have your policy manual and you say, this is my policy and this is how we applied it. Perfect. And it's just like we talk about all the time, making sure that you have your HIPAA compliance documentation um, in place and, and current. And same thing with your OSHA documentation and, and HR goes hand in hand with that. So I would guess that it makes it a lot more efficient in a practice. And, and I liked what you said about it being more secure. If, if employees come to work knowing that there is a policy, even though they don't totally agree with it, but that's the policy and it's going to be administered fairly to everyone, um, then it makes them feel that sense of fairness and sense of belonging. So Adrian, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wonderful expertise. Um, we know that there have been lots of challenges with practices because of the, of the pandemic. Um, Linda, do you have any final comments for us today? Hey, we always put resources on our on our website. So maybe we can put a link to, over to the coronavirus page that um, Ben Derrickson Associates has. So that way, if our listeners have any questions, they can link back over to that. So I just wanted to pop that in as a, as a quick um, plug for our listeners who'd like more HR information. Oh, and thank you, absolutely. Adrian. Absolutely. And I have relied on that so much and referred so many of my clients to that over the course of the pandemic. You all have done a fabulous job with those frequently asked questions. And it's such, such a great resource. So thank we you. thank our listeners for joining us today. Um, remember that if you do have questions, you can submit them to support at thecompliancedivas.com by email. You can visit our website, thecompliancedivas.com, and we hope that you'll join us for future episodes.